Joining me today are panelists both in studio here with me in New York and some virtual panelists. Um, I'll introduce them all and then ask them to actually talk a little bit about themselves and what they do in the space. So joining me is Joshua Ashley Clayman, who is with Linklater's law firm and is uh, one of the heads of their blockchain and fintech practice, which she'll tell you about. In addition, we have here Howard Schweitzer, who is the CEO of Cozen Connor O'Connor Public Strategies and is the former COO of the Troubled Asset Relief Program that was part of the United States Treasury Department. Welcome from DC. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. And then uh, we have over on one of our remote speakers coming all the way late night from Tokyo. It's Masakuza Masujima, who is a partner at the law firm of Mori Hamada and Matsumoto in Tokyo. Good night, good evening, <laughs> Masakuza, how are you? Hi, good evening, um, I'm very happy to be here. Okay, it's good to have you, and we're hoping we get our last remote speaker on, and when he arrives, hopefully I will introduce him. But while we're waiting, let's start with you, Josh. Tell us about your legal practice and your involvement in the digital asset regulation space. Thanks. So my legal practice has morphed over the years. I started as a transactional finance lawyer and a corporate lawyer, and I've been in the digital asset space for several years now. Primarily, I work with companies that are either in the US or trying to enter the US and are in the digital asset space. This may involve interacting with regulators such as the SEC and doing other things to make sure that they get off to a good start and have taken into account legal risks. So you're one of those lawyers who help companies that might be launching a token or some other type of product in blockchain uh, navigate the complex legal issues that are required. Absolutely, absolutely. And I will say this, if you start at the beginning, instead of waiting to address regulation later, you can actually you know, design your project to be legally compliant which we love and believe in so much in the Bitcoin SV ecosystem. So Howard, tell us about your lengthy uh, background in both law and policy. Thanks, Jimmy. Great to be with you all. And I'm Howard Schweitzer, CEO of Cozen O'Connor Public Strategies. Cozen is a 700 lawyer international law firm, and I run the government affairs arm of, of the law firm in addition to practicing a little bit of law. Um, we help our clients navigate through the intersection of government and business, which is uh, very complex these days. And uh, particularly in this space, the intersection of the emerging technology um, of Bitcoin and, and government policy, it's, it's wide open. Um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an incredible opportunity to talk to government and help define the opportunity as opposed to just letting government define it for you. And, and that's what we do across a range of industries, but most especially with you in the Bitcoin SV space. Um, thank you, Howard, for your work with us. And um, you bring a unique perspective given your past experience working within government, and I hope you'll talk about that too today. I, I was the uh, chief operating officer of the TARP, the bank bailout in 2008, 2009 for Hank Paulson and then for Tim Geithner in the Obama administration. Prior to that, I was the general counsel of a federal finance agency, the Export-Import Bank. Um, Treasury, I never thought I'd see the day, Jimmy, where that Treasury experience would come back to life, but nice. here we are. Here we are. Treasury's dusted off our programs from uh, 08, 09, and we're back in crisis mode, so uh, it's as relevant as it's ever been, but it, it's great to be with you. All right, thank you. Now let's go to Tokyo. Uh, Masakuza, would you please uh, tell our audience a little bit about your legal practice and the kind of work you do in the digital asset space in Japan? Okay, sure. Um, my name is Masumashima, partner at Morihamara and Masumoto. Morihamara and Masumoto is a Tokyo-based law firm with multiple branches offices in APAC region. So I'm deeply uh, involved in Japan's cryptocurrency legislation since back in 2014 when the uh, famous uh, Mt. Gox filed a bankruptcy proceeding due to a huge cryptocurrency theft. Back then, uh, I, you know, uh, you know, partner with, uh, you know, private sector people and, uh, you know, uh, create a legislation, actually like lobbying the government to create a new uh, legislation which regulates uh, uh, cryptocurrency to legalize uh, crypto uh, businesses. And 
My recent primary initiative in this space is to lead the private sector and engage with the government uh, so that so so as for Japan market to accept so-called stable coin. Actually, you know, Japan does not, uh, you know, uh, accept the uh, stable coin yet. So this is my uh, current focus. And now representing Europe from the European Commission, we are lucky to have a representative. Uh, Pateras was not able to join us due to a scheduling conflict, but he sent us his fine colleague, who is Dr. Lucas Repa, Senior Policy Officer for the European Commission. Please introduce yourself and tell us about your work in the digital asset space. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for having us from the European Commission. My name is Lucas Repa. I'm a senior policy officer in DG Connect. That's the technological innovation arm of the European Commission. We're doing all things in blockchain, and in particular, lately during the last two years, I, as a lawyer, have also been working with other colleagues on the markets in crypto asset regulation, which has this week been adopted as a legal proposal. Um, by personal background, I'm a qualified attorney at law. I'm working at the European Commission since 2003, since 17 years, most of the time in finance, in payment systems, and then in capital markets and in, in insurance. And since a year and a half, two years now in the technology branch. So I'm delighted to be there and, and looking forward to speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We in the Bitcoin SV ecosystem believe firmly in building a regulation-friendly, legally compliant industry. That doesn't mean there won't be bad actors, there always are. But the more we can create an industry that wins the confidence of governments and big enterprises, the more we believe the technology will grow, just like the internet did in the 1990s. So I want to begin today by talking about what are the top concerns that lawmakers, regulators, and policymakers have about digital assets. Uh, and then how can the industry, particularly in Bitcoin SV, uh, address them? So Josh, what are sort of the top concerns you hear about when you're taking your clients to um, policymakers and regulators? Frankly, how to do it and how to do it in a, with a risk-based approach. Right? A lot of times people will say, okay, we want to be compliant here, but we want to really move ahead in areas where we can and not try and attack everything at once. I think. It's been said many times that there's a lack of regulatory clarity. I actually think that's kind of, at this point, somewhat of a, um, I don't know, an excuse a little bit. I think if you engage with regulators, very often you can find a path forward, but I will say that's part of the concerns that I see. What I will also say, I didn't mention, um, I didn't describe Linklaters at all yes. in my introduction, but we have nearly 3,000 lawyers around the world and over 30 offices and a very robust, robust fintech and digital asset practice. So when we're dealing with clients, they're looking not just at the US, they're often looking mm -hmm. at the entire world. Right. So I think one of the key areas um, is really trying to figure out, you know, if you're looking at a map, where can we get it done compliantly? Right, yeah, because choosing jurisdictional focus is important, even if tokens or our business happens you know, in multiple jurisdictions. Howard, Absolutely. you talk with people in Washington, D.C. all the time. What are you hearing about in terms of top concerns uh, related to the digital asset businesses as well as the assets themselves? Well, I think, Jimmy, there are some overarching concerns in Washington mm -hmm. that cut across a range of issues, things like consumer protection, mm -hmm. privacy, cybersecurity that certainly intersect with mm -hmm. uh, the Bitcoin space, the crypto space. Um, it depends who you talk to. Obviously, AML, KYC issues with um, FinCEN or Paramount, and then um, who regulates who is, is a huge mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, in Congress, it's more of the consumer protection, but it's also as, as Joshua was saying, balancing innovation with those issues. There are people, and most people don't really understand this space. Most of the regulators, they're playing catch up. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree, you have to engage with them. You can't stay on the sidelines and let them define the space for you. You have to define it. Um, but there's gotta be that, you know, there's, there's gotta be that good give and take and that's how you make progress in, in that regard. Got it. Um, let's go to back to Japan. 
Um, and with respect to Tokyo, Masakusa, what are you seeing are the top concerns from Japan's policymakers who are very active in you know, exercising um, uh, regulation and requiring appropriate licensing for digital asset exchanges and digital assets? So what do you think is top of their mind right now? Okay, so as some of you may know, you know, Japan introduced a crypto regulation in 2017, but the, uh, the regulation did not actually fully cover crypto assets business, such as security tokens and ICOs. And after a huge crypto boom and the following notorious crypto theft of CoinCheck amounting as much as like $580 million, FSA tightened the regulation and the crypto asset service providers are virtually deemed as a financial institutions. So basically, the, um, uh, you know, service providers are fully managed by the government. And we also have the uh, self-regulatory organization um, which is authorized to issue, pro promulgate the uh, self-regulation. And actually the self-regulation is pretty much detailed and uh, service providers are actually, you know, uh, bound by those uh, regulations. So, it, you know, they, 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 can't, they, they want to be creative or innovative, but uh, due to those uh, detailed rules, uh, pretty much, you know, their uh, you know business is pretty much restricted. So that the government currently think, you know, the uh, market is pretty much managed, but um, uh, regular, regularly focus would be, of course, uh, uh, investor protection and, of course, the AML. Probably these two uh, topics are the uh, mostly, you know, uh, mentioned by the government. And Lucas, uh, over there in Europe, what's the commission and other policymakers most concerned about? Well, I think we see blockchain technologies and crypto assets in the first place as a big innovation, an innovation with great potential in the manufacturing world, in industry 4.0, in the mobility sector, for smart cities, and for the energy sector. We will see machines paying with tokens, and we want to enable this. And the key concerns that we try to balance with this pro-innovation approach are, of course, as my distinguished speaker from Japan already said, is money laundering concerns, it's fraud, and it's consumer protection. Moreover, in Europe, we also do pay attention to environmental considerations. You know, we have a Green Deal, a big climate change agenda, and we do consider that blockchain technology should also become more environmental friendly. So these are the big concerns. In addressing the concerns, we really try to balance with innovation. We try to be as proportionate as possible. And those of you who might have already taken a first look at the draft proposal for a comprehensive regulatory package for crypto assets in the European Union might have seen that we take quite a, a nuanced approach. I'm happy to discuss this. Thank you. Um, and I think that is a very important point, which is even as a former lawyer, I can tell you when representing clients, Clients and companies want to innovate. They want to expand the uh, boundaries of what blockchain and digital asset technology can do. So whatever policy is drawn, we hope, really does balance the need to protect these concerns versus driving innovation. So Josh, let's talk about the state of regulations that exist today in the United States and what you think they should be shaped like in the future. You are working here in New York City, which has the infamous BIT license. Um, do you think that the BIT license um, in New York has achieved uh, desirable goals uh, or not? Well, thanks for that question. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. So the BIT license obviously has its fans and its non-fans. Um, I think if we go back five years to when it was introduced mm -hmm. and we think about what the aims were, which was <clears throat> presumably consumer protection and fostering innovation, it was a very different landscape in the digital asset space, and there were very different types of, of players, and, and there was a very different, I don't know, audience for it. What I will say is that, as many of you know, um, rather than necessarily always fostering innovation, some folks decided that it would be too difficult to apply for mm -hmm. and have actually tried to avoid New York, or they've, they've moved up. They've, Basically, when people come and they say, okay, we want to get money transmission licenses or some other type of licensing, how fast can we do it in each place within mm -hmm. the U.S.? 
And then the, for New York, it's kind of been an outlier. Now the bit license folks have tried to make it more accommodating, including with conditional licensing mm -hmm. and things. Right. But what I would say is, I think, looking at what's going on in the US and frankly around the world, there seems to be a move to try and unite things. So mm -hmm. rather than having outlier states, mm -hmm. you know, having common, yes common regulation and common approaches. Which is, especially in the United States, which has this state-by-state -state approach um, in a lot of areas of law, not just money transmission, it's very difficult for companies to figure out how to comply. So Howard, on that note, what do you think about the push for a more federal, one national regulatory system for digital asset exchanges? There's just been introduced into the House of Representatives, and I understand it's past the House of Representatives now, the Digital Community Exchange Act of 2020, co-sponsored by a bipartisan partisan group of legislators, including Representative Darren Soto, which would put the um, regulation of digital asset exchanges under the governance of the CFTC. Right. Um, what do you think of that approach? I think it's good. Uh, there's not going to be innovation in this space or the level of innovation that is possible mm -hmm. with a 50 state, if you're serving 50 different state authorities at the same time. And I don't think anybody wants this to become the next land of insurance where you've got all these different regulators. Insurance has been around since the beginning of time. Um, cryptocurrencies have not been. And so hopefully, I think, that, I think the will is there to try to federalize this right. and approach it. Because other countries down. like Japan have just one national licensing scheme, Canada, so why not the U.S.? Yeah, they, I think there's a recognition that to unlock the potential, you have to do it at the top level. And may I just jump in about sure, something? Please. So in a recent, recently there was a UNIDWA working group session, right, mm -hmm. um, that brought together jurisdictions from around the world. Obviously we can't talk about what happened, but it's very challenging when you, when you deal with other countries that have one regulator, Right, and then you're trying to explain how the U.S. is very different and you have states and you have federal and, and many different views. So I do think that moving in that direction is potentially a positive. I also say with respect to that particular law, one of the really cool things is that for folks that did ICOs or fundraising, that's kept separate in the jurisdiction of the SEC mm -hmm. so that you can have something where you could have a clear line once you've delivered what you've fundraised for. Yeah, and in the Bitcoin SV ecosystem, as we've heard about today and in the coming days, there are many new types of ventures that are using BSV for many different things, so for data, as well as tokens, um, all kinds of usages that starts blurring the line about what might be a covered regulated service provider in the future. So getting clarity is important. Let's go to Japan. Um, Masakusa, please give us any updates um, that our world would like to know about in the way the Japan FSA and the JCV EEA are using to approve new licenses um, in Japan for either exchanges or actual specific digital assets. Okay, so to date, uh, we have 21 licensed crypto assets exchange service providers, and the total trading volume is um, uh, about like six billion dollars per month in terms of uh, spot trading and. $30 billion in margin trading. I'm not sure whether this is um, huge or not, but uh, this is a, you know, Japan's current uh, trading volume. And uh, probably, you know, the government, you know, uh, like, a, you know, uh, as I said, you know, the regulation are actually tightened and, uh, you know, the market are kind of like chilled, but the, at the same time, you know, the uh, government, uh, like FSA, as uh, uh, FSA's uh, practices actually turned back to normal so that they started to issue the new licenses and they started to uh, accept the new tokens to be listed. For example, the recent uh, uh, cases, uh, uh, Braves, uh, BAT token, the basic attention token, they are now traded on the Japan market. And because of this uh, new uh, trend, currently uh, there are increasing number of like foreign uh, blockchain project that are, you know, uh, approaching to us to, you know, seek the opportunity for their tokens to be listed on the market. I think this is a good trend and the recent uh, Japan's good side of the 
uh, market. So people are just welcome to those uh, new trends. Uh, and Lucas, I know you were telling us a little bit earlier about some uh, interesting updates um, for, out of the uh, EU. Want to give our audience a quick summary? Certainly. So in the European Union, uh, the funny thing is about the EU, we have 27 different member states. And you would think that necessarily you have 27 different laws for cryptocurrency exchanges. And until very recently, that has also been the case. But with the adoption of this legislative proposal I've uh, mentioned just now, we want to establish what we call a one-stop shop for cryptocurrency exchanges and crypto service providers in the European Union. So what would happen is that as a cryptocurrency exchange, you could file for authorization for a license with one of the 27 national supervisors of your choice. And if that is approved, you would benefit from a European passport. That means that you could provide your services as cryptocurrency exchange to the entire European Union. This is a commission proposal of this week. At the moment, with this proposal not yet being endorsed in law, we still have the situation that there are, like in the USA, different laws at the national level. One national law, for instance, on cryptocurrency exchanges is a law that has been adopted by Malta. That law has been rather successful, I would say, in attracting foreign cryptocurrency exchanges. You may have heard about Binance that is relocated from Hong Kong to Malta. And there has been another recent announcement. So I think uh, this is a good example. But we want, of course, to, to send a clear signal to the world that Europe is open for business and that we are able to provide one single consolidated legal framework for cryptocurrency exchanges in Europe. Well, as we learned in my opening presentation, I do like the power of one. So Europe is open for business with one consolidated market for digital assets. Um, I want to ask all of the panelists this question, which we, we focus a lot on exchanges and other types of digital asset service providers. But do you think government regulators will be looking to regulate other types of companies that operate with digital assets, besides exchanges and custodial wallets, for example. Do you foresee that coming? I Josh. do. I think as, as things become more and more mainstream, I think that, that there likely will be more regulation. Because as things begin to touch, I've always thought, you know, since I've been in this space, this is the center of the universe, mm -hmm. right? And that everyone should know and be involved with digital assets. However, when you really think about it, it's actually a much smaller piece of a much more large mm -hmm. global pie of different types of businesses but now that we're seeing real you know large businesses and enterprises begin to dip their toes into the dis digital asset space or in mm -hmm. some cases dive right in I do think that there will be um, increased regulation and if I may say one other thing I do think and this is broad and we'll probably I'm sure talk about it later but I think DeFi in general that word yep. is being used all over the place, it's like DeFi theater. Right. And I think that we're going to begin seeing regulation about that. Do you, on the DeFi uh, uh, note, do you think DeFi of this year is the ICO a few years ago and that there's lots of things being sold out there that you know law will catch up with in the future? It, seem, it seems like it. And I, I agree that um, government's going to follow the trail. And mm -hmm. there are governments always a little bit behind the innovation curve, mm -hmm. maybe a lot behind the innovation curve. Um, but I think as things shift from just focusing on tradeability mm -hmm. to focusing on usability, mm -hmm. that's really where the innovation will be and that's where government's going to go. Um, so for Japan, do we think, do you think, um, Asakusa, that the Japan FSA might start looking into licensing or regulating other forms of digital asset businesses? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, in Japan currently, the DeFi is gaining popularity. And actually, you know, how the DeFi business is regulated is kind of like an open question here. And, uh, you know, FSA has not yet moved on, you know, uh, any additional regulation, but uh, uh, going forward, probably if the DeFi gains popularity and if there is any, like, a, you know, bad thing, like, you know, 
uh, fraud or whatever, the, anything, probably, you know, they will gonna introduce additional uh, regulation that addresses the DeFi. I don't know how though they are, you know, creating the new regulation, but uh, probably that's uh, one uh, possibility. Lucas, in Europe, do you see any concern from policymakers about the need to um, implement regulations or guidance that might govern other forms of digital asset businesses? Well, I think this draft proposal for this comprehensive regulation of crypto assets in the European Union is so broad that it would potentially also cover DeFi. What we're regulating are activities of crypto asset service providers, and this is quite broadly defined, and we hope future proof. It ranges from the custodianship of wallet providers to operating trading platforms, exchange services, fiat to crypto or crypto to crypto, the execution of the orders, the placing of the orders, the reception and transmission of orders, and advice related to crypto assets. So that's pretty broad. What we do not regulate is the technology. We want the technology to evolve freely. So the node operators are not considered financial service providers. It's the service providers that make use of the technology to offer financial services to consumers, and consumers should be protected. That's a good explanation of the distinctions that uh, you're drawing. I have a question from the audience. Are there any lobbying efforts, they ask about in the US, but I'm curious in other jurisdictions, to push for changes in tax law so that small transactions are not treated like the sale of stock or a capital gain um, to enable Bitcoin SV to function as money. So for example, in Bitcoin SV, we believe a lot in micro transactions, right. micro payments. But are there, do you, what do you think about pushing for policy that treats uh, the trading of a digital asset, if it's, for example, creates a gain under a certain amount of money, that it should not be subject to capital gains tax. There's some legislation out there to do just okay. that, Jimmy. Here in the US? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think um, that'll happen. I think it'll come because that's part of mm -hmm. taking this from, taking this to a place where it's actually functional. Correct, and from a inv speculative investment to a utility. Exactly. A uh, commodity that we use exactly. in daily life. Do you know what the monetary threshold is being proposed? I don't remember offhand. I don't recall okay. either. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's a de minimis amount. Right. That's what I remember, right. de minimis. Right. Yeah. Um, um, in uh, Japan, Masakusa, do you know if there's any uh, efforts to try and create policy that treats as not taxable the gains on digital assets below a certain number? Yeah, actually, uh, I'm uh, um, I'm a member of the you know tax lobbying group for the you know crypto businesses, mm -hmm. and actually the you know this uh, small number exemption is one of the uh, main topics that we raised to the government to create a new uh, you know uh, exemption, actually, which is just a small amount, like two thousand uh, dollar exemption, which actually is. Uh, exi does exist in the area of the uh, like currency trading. So probably if the government is uh, you know neutral on the crypto businesses, then uh, you know they should you know uh, adopt the similar regulation as a uh, currency trading uh, you know uh, taxation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, we are not sure whether the government accepts our argument or not. But we'll see, you know, uh, it's going to be uh, within yeah. uh, several months uh, before we got that uh, conclusion. Uh, Lucas, this is an important issue for making digital assets more usable, especially as the native token for to power a blockchain, right, where the usage might create a capital gain or loss at any given moment. Has there been discussion in the European Commission about how to treat taxability of lower amount gains? So I think to reply to this question, I have to explain a little bit how the European Union works. Um, there are still certain competencies which the 27 member states of the European Union have retained, which are not in Brussels. And fiscal competences are amongst those. So the question to which extent the proceeds from crypto assets are taxable income is a question that is being defined at the national level. Uh, we have no powers here to recommend a certain course of action. 
Okay. Well, I think it's an important question to really be um, answered in a positive way, especially for the BSV ecosystem, which really believes in this huge volume of microtransactions, which are constantly going to create some form of capital gain or loss. Um, let's take a look at the sort of general question of how to create policy that best balances the two goals, protection of consumers and other investors, as well as encouraging innovation of blockchain technology. How do you recommend the industry that's watching today out across our feed best engage with policymakers to see that their interests for innovation are best fulfilled? All right, and by the way, I don't think we gave this disclaimer before, but none of this is legal advice none or investment advice. None of this is legal advice, advice or okay. more investment and advice. And nothing based on anyone's firms or anything, it's just our own just personal Just your personal views. thoughts. Exactly. So, in terms of, of how to best interact with policymakers, I think I'll, I'll defer to Howard over here, but what I would say in terms of an approach that I think works best, just personal view, I think a principles-based approach really works better in many cases than a prescriptive approach for policy. Because, as someone mentioned, government is always going to lag innovation. Right? And it's because of, of principles-based approaches that we're able to apply laws in a variety of scenarios. Now this does bring up sort of a complicating factor, a tension, because things like the Howey test, which many people are like, oh, the Howey right. test. The, the test reason, for securities, whether yes, something's a covered security in the US. Exactly. The reason that that can still be applied over 70 years later is that it's based on principles. So I think what we ultimately, what would be good to do is to have a principles-based approach rather than highly prescriptive. But Yeah, I, I, I think you have to um, meet people where they are. You have to talk to policymakers. For one, just talk in plain English. Right. I mean, Jimmy, as you and I have made the rounds in DC. We have, um, we have together. On Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. at Treasury, with the regulators. There are varying levels of understanding Correct. of the technology and the potential. And um, just one very simple thing is you have to speak to people in terms that they can understand. Far too often in Washington, and I'm sure elsewhere around the world, when people are talking to policymakers and regulators, they talk over them, not to them and with them. And, and so that's a very elementary point, but, but it's, it's really critical. I think you have to de um, develop your technologies in a way that is consistent with the law and, and regulation. And think forward, be forward thinking about how they intersect. And obviously... Um, Do you think that influences policymakers positively? If you could say, I developed this technology or 100%. some fe features in a way with compliance in mind? And, yeah. and yeah, Do you think that's good? Absolutely, absolutely. And it, um, it's part of educating them, it's part of showing them how you can do something that's innovative while at the same time complying with the law. You have to give them real world examples that they can learn from. And so I, I think that's really, really yeah. critical. Yeah. And showing is often better than telling. Exactly. Right? And may I just yes. add just for the regulatory, for approaching regulators that I can, I can speak yes. to a bit, which is, you know, as, as Howard said, speaking their language, but also really trying to understand there are people at these regulators who are looking at this. It's not just this, this regulator, this body, right? right? And so understanding what their questions are, what their concerns are, often you can say, this is, I, I'm hearing your concern, and this is how we're planning to address it from the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. It's, as I said earlier, define the solution. Don't wait for them to define right. it because right. that's, that's the age old trick to dealing with government. Tell them what you want, where you want to land. Don't leave them and cross your fingers behind your back and hope that they're going to come out where you want them to because they're not. You have to, you have to define the solution for them. And that you need some engagement in order to do that and it takes time. It does, it does. Masakuza, do you have advice um, for uh, businesses and uh, developers, the ventures watching you today about how they can best engage with policymakers and regulators in Japan to ensure that innovation is protected while the regulators are still trying to you know, uh, have consumer protection? Okay, so, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, the private sector are, were 
very creative in you know in creating the new services and you know explaining to the uh, FSA that hey this is a new businesses and this business has these potential blah 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 so these kind of argument war uh, actually work but uh, uh, you know after the you know big hype and uh, uh, you know uh, the regularly you know regular uh, tighten, tightening of the regulation. Uh, the government or the FSA is a little bit cautious about uh, those kind of like narratives. So they are kind of like, you know, uh, suspicious about uh, the private sector's, you know, uh, story. So we are kind of like, you know, struggling uh, with engaging with the government in terms of the crypto businesses. So one of the uh, big uh, example for this is a stable coin. Uh, because, you know, as you know, if we, uh, you, know, uh, you know, promote the security tokens, uh, of course, we need a uh, you know, stable coin. But the government is very much cautious about the stable coin, uh, probably partly due to, you know, uh, there is a, you know, F, uh, FSB, you know, uh, report or, you know, um, other uh, countries are saying that are uh, very, you know, harsh thing and so on and so on. So the FSA would be very cautious in engaging with the private sector in terms of the new, uh, you know, invention of a creation of the new stable coins. So that's a uh, current situation in Japan. Ah, so stable coins, an area of particular, I think, sensitivity for uh, governments. Um, and Lucas, what advice do you have for our viewers here about how they can best engage with the European Commission or um, policymakers in the member states of the EU um, to best drive innovation for blockchain technology? So there are perhaps two things um, I could say on that. So as European Commission, we are trying to be as inclusive in our dialogue with the industry. And to be very frank, the difficulty we often have is that you have easy contact to uh, representatives of the industry that can pay professional representatives, consultants and advisors. It's more difficult to reach out and to meet the small startups and the scale-ups. So one thing that we do is we have become member to the governmental advisory board of the International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications, the INATPA, which is a global body that represents the blockchain industry and a lot of startups are there as well. So we think that we have quite a good channel to speak to the blockchain community as a whole and not only to a few big players. That's one thing. We try to be balanced. We try to speak to everybody and we encourage stakeholders to speak through this body, this INATPA. Another thing that we're doing is we, we are uh, more and more inclined to support regulatory sandboxes, which provide an interactive way between financial supervisors mm -hmm. at the national level and the startups to talk and to understand the legal framework. And one thing we've done in the recent regulatory proposal is that we have created a possibility for financial supervisors to temporarily lift financial regulations towards companies and towards business models they're supervising closely. So basically it's a big pan-European regulatory sandbox that would be created for all 27 financial regulators, giving them the flexibility to lift certain requirements of financial rules in order to support DLT innovation of blockchains, in particular, the tokenization of assets and uh, the use of distributed ledger technologies for issuing bond equity and other tokenized uh, financial instruments. That's some great advice. Uh, in, and with respect to reaching out to Bitcoin SV companies, that's one of the roles we play at Bitcoin Association. I spend a lot of time with people like Howard engaging in relationship building with policymakers and government representatives around the world. So we do that on behalf of Bitcoin SV. So feel free to reach out to me and my organization if you want to engage with the BSV community. Um, I, I, with our last minute here, I'll ask Howard the last question, which is um, we very much believe in this mission to bring 
uh, regulation friendly ecosystem to the entire industry, not Bitcoin SV, all digital assets, uh, and are trying to help develop solutions technically and in business industry processes to help that along. How do you think that message is being heard or reacted to among policymakers, and what can our ecosystem do to help contribute? I think, uh, I think it's being heard, it's beginning to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I think it's the continued education, it is mm -hmm. the continued engagement, it's showing up. Mm -hmm. um, it's keeping the, keeping the lines of communication open and, and explain, bringing them along as we innovate. I think that's really the key. And, and I, again, f shifting the conversation, I think, for too long, the conversation has been people reading the Wall Street Journal and watching, you know, the price of price Bitcoin. Go up and down, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's where people have focused their attention when it comes to cryptocurrencies. But that's not where the potential lies. And I think shining a light on that, Jimmy, and explaining how these things have real-world application is where the real opportunity is. Well, that's a great way to end this panel. It's something we really focus on in the BSV ecosystem building, as I like to say, real utility for real value long-term, because that makes everyone happy, from consumers, businesses, to government representatives. So I want to thank our global panel, those of us coming remotely, Masakusa from Tokyo, uh, Lucas from, I believe you're in Brussels now, right, Lucas? Um, yes, that's and correct. From Europe, and our two, Panelists here in studio, Howard from Washington, D.C. He came up from the good old capital of our country to Josh here in New York City. We hope you'll consider thinking about how you, as companies in the BSV ecosystem or the broader blockchain industry, can help contribute to a regulation-friendly ecosystem for the betterment of all of our technology dreams. Thank you. Build your future on BSV with TAL, a world-class blockchain infrastructure and service provider helping companies to build applications and services on the Bitcoin SV network. Led by industry experts, built on a solid foundation for sustainable business growth. Direct transaction submission, fee transparency at standard and volume rates. Regulated and publicly traded, TAL brings an unparalleled level of compliance and regulatory standard that private processors and operators can't offer. Build a business today that will succeed tomorrow with TAL. Discover more about TAL today at TAAL.com.